So uh, before I start uh, my talk, uh, I just wanted to give a few words about the Druid community in Israel. Uh, a few years ago, we were only four companies, as far as I know, using Druid in Israel. Uh, Apps Flyer, Asset Nielsen, Fiber, and Zuz, which are now part of Payu. And I'm happy to say that a few years later, there are dozens of companies using Druid in Israel, including Verizon Media, uh, which are going to talk today uh, at the next session, Outbrain, WalkMe, and many others. Also, I'm really proud and thrilled to host folks from Inplay today uh, that came uh, all the way from around the world, actually. Uh, and Inplay was founded by the creators of uh, Druid, for those of you uh, who are not familiar with them. And lastly, uh, maybe in the future we'll have Druid EU Summit in Tel Aviv. So uh, I'm hoping uh, and rooting for that. Uh, that's it. Um, so my talk today will be about final analysis with uh, Spark and Druid. And just to present myself, my name is Itai Yaffe. I'm a tech lead of uh, the big data group here at Nielsen. Um, and I've been dealing with big data challenges so, uh, for several years now. I'm also one of the co-organizers of Big Things and the co-founder of the uh, Women in Big Data uh, Israeli chapter. And I would like to know a, bit, a little bit about you. So how many here are data engineers? Woo, show hands. OK. Data architects? OK, something else. <laughs> OK, why are you here? So how many here, show hands, are newbies uh, to Druid and want to learn how it can solve some use cases? OK. How many here have some expertise with Druid and want to know how to optimize it? OK. How many here are here to support a colleague and don't care about Druid at all? Woo! OK. <laughs> Probably should have done this part anonymously, but moving on. Uh, so uh, today, what you learn, you learn about Apache Druid. I'll give a brief overview and common use cases. Uh, then we'll dive into final analysis. We'll see what it is and why we care about it. Uh, we'll talk about the challenges in doing fun analysis and how you can combine Spark and Druid for the win. And I'll finish, up, uh, finish off with a few tips. Okay, uh, just a few words, uh, not too much, about uh, uh, Nielsen and the RD Center here in Israel. So it's based on the acquisition of a startup called Excelate a few years ago by Nielsen, which is the uh, global data and measurement company. Um, we are a data company, which means we collect device level data from around the internet. We enrich it using machine learning models, and then we provide, it, uh, provide insights on it to our customers in order uh, for them to better target their audiences and uh, be able to uh, make better business decisions. Uh, just some numbers, because at least some of us are uh, engineers, I'm, I'm guessing most of us. Uh, so in our Kafka clusters, we have over 10 billion events per day. Uh, our data lake is based on AWS S3, and we have over 20 terabytes per day of snappy parquet. Uh, we use Spark, uh, we're talking about thousands of nodes per day, and we ingest ter uh, tens of terabytes of data into our Druid clusters. And finally, uh, uh, probably interesting, we have a monthly bill in AWS, which is a few hundred thousand dollars a month. So Druid, as, uh, as I've seen from the uh, survey before, uh, not everyone are familiar with it, so I will give a brief overview. Uh, Druid is main things. Uh, so it's scalable, it's an all-up database, it's fast, it can provide real-time analytics, columnar, time, um, time series, cost-effective, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but let's see what all those buzzwords really mean. So first of all, Druid is a time series uh, database. So it partitions the data first and foremost by some, some kind of a timestamp column, like this timestamp column in the example behind me. Other types of columns in Druid are dimension columns like these attribute columns where you just can filter your data by. And the last type of columns are metric columns where you can aggregate your data by. All those types of columns comprise of what we call in Druid a data source, which is basically an equivalent to a table in a relational database. Another thing you need to know about Druid is it has a very powerful feature that's called rollup. Now, when we're talking about uh, OLAP and analytical uh, database, we don't really care about the raw data like uh, the raw events in this table, but we actually want uh, the final result or the aggregated data, like uh, this table here. So if we are talking about a use case, for example, of counting how many uh, devices have uh, been exposed 
to a specific uh, online advertisement. Okay, so what we will do, we will use Druid uh, aggregation at ingestion time to aggregate based on the dimension we chose, which in our example is the attribute. And you can see that what finally resides in Druid after the ingestion is just a more, much more compacted uh, result, basically the aggregated result based on the timestamp, the uh, dimension we chose to aggregate by, and a count. And you can see, of, of course, that's a made up example, but if you're talking about millions and billions of events per day, you can understand that this uh, uh, feature is very powerful, both in terms of the storage needed to store the aggregated data and the time it takes to query it. So at a really high level, and I know this uh, uh, slide is a bit outdated, but I really like uh, the way it presents the different Druid components. So Druid has three types of processes. It has processes to uh, ingest the data. It has processes to query the data. And it has processes to manage all that orchestration. So talking about ingestion, you can ingest data into Druid uh, in real time, for example, through Kafka, into what Druid calls real-time nodes. Or you can ingest data in batch using MapReduce jobs into a component that Druid calls a deep storage, which is basically a scalable storage like HDFS or S3. From there, the data is being loaded in background into, the, uh, into another type of nodes that are called historical nodes. And then we have the data available, the historical data available for queries. Looking at uh, the query side, you can query uh, Druid either using the native uh, query language, which is JSON-based, or using uh, the relatively newly added SQL language, uh, and send the queries from the client to another type of nodes that are called broker nodes, which basically pass the query they get. They send the relevant parts to either the real-time nodes or the historical nodes that hold the relevant data. They get the result back, and then they, are, they do the final aggregation and return the result to the client. So at a high level, uh, uh, this is basically an implementation of the Lambda architecture. So Druid is very cool. Uh, take it from me, we have been using uh, Druid for about four years, and it's been uh, uh, used in production by uh, many uh, companies of all shapes and sizes. So. Uh, Airbnb and eBay, Netflix, uh, uh, Nielsen, Upsfire, as I mentioned, Imply, uh, and many others. But we really care about the use cases that we can use Druid for. So Druid can be used for various use cases, uh, varying from click stream analytics, so think about the activities users are doing on your website, your e-commerce, whatever. Network performance uh, monitoring, for example, you can ingest your load balancer logs into Druid and gain insights in real time on what's going on in your uh, network traffic. You can do application performance management, supply chain analytics, BI, and all up, and a lot uh, more use cases. So just to summarize this part uh, uh, about Druid, so Druid is a, a real-time analytics database. It's time series and it's columnar. And Ben from Imply, Ben, please raise your hand. Yeah, was Ben. Ben is going to uh, uh, talk about how you can implement Druid and will describe Druid's roadmap. Uh, you can ingest and store trillions of events and serve analytic queries in sub-second. And Eddie from Verizon, Eddie, where are you? Please return. Eddie is going to talk about the ingestion part and uh, a very uh, early on way to optimize it. Druid is very high, uh, scalable and cost-effective. And as we've seen, it's being used by various data companies for a lot uh, of use cases, like the one we're going to focus today, which is clickstream analytics and specifically funnel analysis. So talking about funnel analysis, I'm sure not all of you are familiar with this term. So think about yourself as a user. So uh, you have, uh, you know, you were exposed to some adver online advertisement, okay? This is the awareness phase. Next, you might consider uh, uh, doing something with it. Uh, for example, you click that advertisement. The next step is the intent. So you actually uh, take uh, active measures in order to purchase the product. Uh, for example, you click the Add to Cart. And finally, you might uh, uh, actually purchase it and uh, complete uh, the uh, bill and, and pay for that. Just for uh, uh, our naming convention, uh, convention, so we all know the terms. So 
the first phase, which is the awareness phase where the user is being exposed to uh, advertisement, is called by us at least a tactic. Why? Because a, an advertiser can use various tactics to uh, advertise its products. The next phase is the uh, consideration, intent, and purchase are called stages. So from the campaign owner or from the advertiser point of view, you can see that usually millions or you know, billions even of users were exposed to the advertisement. Then usually there's a significant drop off and a lot less users are actually considering the product or clicking the ad, etc. Then another significant drop off uh, and fewer users than that actually uh, taken active measures in order to purchase the product. And if the campaign owner is lucky, some of the users actually uh, paid and bought the product. Now, why is it called a funnel? Because you can see that it has uh, a funnel shape. And in this made up example, uh, 100 million user, unique users were exposed to uh, um, the advertisement. Then we had uh, a significant drop off, about I don't know, 15 million users uh, reached the homepage. 10 million of them reached the product page. And finally, uh, 3 million of them actually went to the checkout, uh, checkout and completed the purchase. Now, some of you probably are wondering what is UU or unique users. So this is something I want to uh, uh, take a minute to discuss. Now, we as users are browsing the internet. We have views, right? We can, uh, in this example, uh, there were seven views of various products or advertisement. But those seven views were done by only two users. So as an advertiser or a campaign owner, what I care about is how many unique users were exposed to my campaign and actually do, done something with it, right? I don't care how many views there are. I care about how many users uh, actually did something with my campaign because this translates directly to a purchase. So usually one user means one purchase, not three views means one purchase. And that's on the advertiser side. On the technical side of things, it's relatively easy to count the number of views or the number of hits in a web page, but it's, a, uh, it's much more complicated to count the number of unique users. And I'm going to describe the, the way to do it later on in this talk. Now, as you probably understand, uh, advertisers spend a lot, a lot, a lot of money on their campaigns. So everyone wants to measure the campaign efficiency. But how can we do it? So first, we need to collect a huge stream of events, right? Billions of uh, uh, user activities uh, uh, that are done around the internet every day. Then we need to map those events into the final stages, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So for example, the ad exposure would be a tactic. Finally, we need to be able to provide insights quick, quickly in order to actually do something uh, uh, with my campaign. Perhaps I need to, uh, I don't know, stop advertising on one channel and start advertising on another channel. So uh, there are a few uh, off-the-shelf alternatives for that. And obviously, uh, each alternative has its pros and cons. But, uh, and I'm a bit biased here, but um, there are a few uh, you know, significant topics to bear in mind. So uh, in terms of scalability, uh, some of those uh, off-the-shelf alternatives are limited, have a limited scalability. Some of them lack access to the raw data. And finally, most of them, uh, when they need to do count distinct operations in order to count the number of unique users, are doing it very, very slowly. Luckily, uh, Druid is very suitable for this task because, as we mentioned, Druid is highly scalable. It can store uh, trillions of events. And it can do subsequent sub approximation of the count distinct with set operations. So for example, uh, intersections, union, negations with the Theta Sketch module. But I didn't talk about the Theta Sketch module, so let's see what Theta Sketch is. Uh, Theta Sketch basically is a mathematical framework, which is a generalization of an algorithm called KMV or K minimum values. Uh, this is an approximation algorithm, so it allows us to take a sample of our all uh, our raw stream of events and based on that sample estimate the cardinality or the number of unique elements uh, in the original set. It also supports, uh, as I mentioned, set theoretic operations so we can 
intersect, union, and negate uh, between various sets. What you need to take into account, and I mentioned that it's called KMV, so the K in KMV stands for uh, uh, the, the size of the sample you take from your original set. So the larger the sample size I take from the original set, obviously the error rate that I will get from this approximation algorithm is, uh, is significantly lower. And even for, not, for a relatively small size of 32,000 for the uh, sample size, we usually get around 1% uh, error rate, and it's really good. Uh, of course, there's a trade-off because the larger the K I use, or the larger the sample I take from the original set, the more memory I need and the more storage I need in order to store the sample, and query will take longer, of course. Okay, time for a quick demo. I uh, hope it will work. Okay, so um, I'm going to start off with, uh, can you see my screen? Okay, so uh, what this demo uh, is intended to show you the uh, effect of the size of the K on the accuracy rate in real time. So we're going to use a really, a really low K, which is just four. And you can see that as we add more uh, elements to the set, the error, because we use a, a really low K, the error is relatively high. So we're uh, sometimes talking about uh, you know, even uh, more than, uh, uh, you know, 10, 10%, percent, 20 percent, it's really high. I'm going to stop it here. And now I'm going to use, say, uh, k equals 4,000, which is much larger k. And almost instantly, you can see that the accuracy rate is much better. Because we uh, store more samples, or we take more samples from the original set. Okay, cool. So uh, there is uh, an implementation of the test sketch module within Druid. It's a part of the data sketches library. And what happens at query time, those sketches or those samples we stored in Druid at ingestion time are basically aggregated, so union intersection or difference between sketches. And the result is the estimated number, because we're talking about approximation. So it's the estimated number of unique entries in the aggregated sketch. Uh, I'll share the slides later, but uh, I'll also share a, uh, a link to a video that explains better about uh, a data sketch and how you can use it in Druid. Okay, so going back to funnel analysis, because that's why we're here today. So the simple use case for funnel analysis is as follows. How many unique users have viewed the online ad versus how many unique users viewed the online ad and viewed a specific product page, right? Because we want to know if our campaign was efficient. So I know you can see, but just uh, I, uh, this is one, I'll zoom in in a second, but this is a screenshot from uh, our actual system. And you can see the, uh, the way we uh, represent the drop off in the funnel. Let's zoom in for a second. So the tactic, as I mentioned, is an online ad. We can see that about 8 million users or unique users were exposed to that uh, advertisement. And of them, only about 3,000 uh, reached the home page. But being engineers, we want to know how we do it, right? So at a high level, this is our uh, final analysis pipeline. And I'll zoom in each of the components in a second, but just at a high level. Uh, everything starts with our data lake, which is S3 based, as I mentioned. Then we have a Spark application that's called Mart Generator, which basically reads all the events from the previous day from our data lake and writes uh, all the events that are relevant per campaign or partitioned by campaign to a different bucket in S3. The next phase is the Enricher, which is another Spark application, which basically takes uh, the events per campaign, enriches them, and basically builds those funnels that I uh, talked about and writes the uh, enriched data back to S3. From there, the way uh, from there we use a MapReduce job, a built-in MapReduce job in Druid, in order to load the data in Druid. Now let's zoom in each of the components to see how we do it. Uh, if it's short, but I prefer the end. Yep. Druid can read public files. Yes. Uh, 
Okay, uh, I'll answer that quickly. Uh, with Hadoop ingestion, it can uh, ingest packet files. With the native batch ingestion beginning yesterday, it can read packet files as well. So yay for the invite, guys. Thank you. Uh, okay. So let's zoom in uh, each of the components. So starting from our data lake, uh, our data lake is partitioned uh, by date. And each date just hold all the events for the specific date. So you can see we have, again, a really simplified example. We have the event time with the date and time. We have the user ID that performed the activity. And we have an attribute, which is basically what the user actually did. So view the online ad or visit the homepage, et cetera. Next phase is the mouse generator. As I mentioned, it basically partitions the events by campaign. So you can see that for each campaign, we have uh, subfolders for dates, and there we have similar uh, uh, sorry columns. So the event time, the user ID, the attribute, and we also mapped the attribute to its uh, um, type in the funnel. So online ad is a tactic, homepage is a stage, and the product specific product page is also a stage. Next phase is, is the enricher uh, uh, process, which, as I mentioned, build the actual funnels. So you can see that for each campaign and for each date, what we have is the event date. We no longer have the timestamp, but only the date, because as I will show in a minute, we care about uh, uh, day uh, uh, resolution or granularity. So when we measure campaigns, we care about what happened in a specific day uh, in our use case and not really about what happened in a specific second. Uh, we again have the user ID, and now we have a specific column that's called tactic and which tactic actually happened, and we have the stage, we describe the stage that happened in that funnel. I'm gonna uh, describe the way you ingest data into Druid. Now, keep in mind that we are using, as I mentioned, the Hadoop way to ingest data. Uh, there are other ways to ingest data. You can ingest in real time, you can ingest in the new native batch ingestion, but uh, we find that for our use cases, the Hadoop uh, ingestion is still um, the best you know, ROI. So um, again, I'll show these slides, no worries, but uh, we have a type for the ingestion task. This JSON basically uh, represents the ingestion task. So we use index Hadoop. We say which data source or which table we're going to ingest the data to. We say what is the granularity or what is the uh, you know, uh, lowest level of resolution we want to use. In our case, it's the day. And we also specify the intervals or the date range where the events will be uh, put into. We then need to specify the specs for those three types of columns that I mentioned. So we have the timestamp spec, which is the column that will be used to partition by uh, time or date. We have the dimensions where we will uh, be able to later filter the data by. So we have tactic and stage, as I showed you. And then we have a metric. In our use case, simplified example, just one metric. And it's a data sketch type metric. And we also set the size or the uh, K value of the KMV, which is, again, uh, the size of the sample we take from the original set. We actually use 65,000, which is relatively high. The last part is the input spec. And what we'll do here is basically use multi to combine the data that already resides within Druid. Right? We take uh, data from the data source, the specific data source, uh, this campaign. And we combine the metrics with uh, the new events that arrived in the S3 uh, bucket. So using multi-ingestion, we can uh, append, so to speak, uh, new events into Druid. That's, that's uh, no and yes, let's, let's take it after uh, you know, the uh, Q&A uh, part. OK, so we ingest the data into Druid, and now we have, and now we have uh, in our use case, data source per campaign. And for each campaign, you can see, again, uh, uh, just as simplified, we have the timestamp column, we have the tactic dimension, we have the stage dimension, and we have the user ID sketch, which basically uh, is the data sketch object that holds the sample of the data. And now we need to query it. So I'm not going to go over the native language, and you probably can understand why. Uh, I'm going to show you the example uh, for the SQL language. And um, 
And this specific uh, uh, query returns the estimate the number of unique users that both view the online ad and view the homepage. And the way uh, it is done, uh, it's uh, using the approximate count distinct data sketch um, uh, term uh, from the specific data source we want to query, where the static is this and the stage is this, and this is the time interval. So obviously you can see that using the SQL is much, much easier than using the native language. Okay, moving on. So you probably remember the result. This is how it looked like. So we had the number of unique uh, users per, uh, that viewed the online ad, number of unique users that uh, uh, viewed the, or visited the homepage, and then uh, how many users viewed the product page. Now, I wonder how many of you uh, actually noticed that, but something is not right, correct? The numbers just don't add up. Uh, and the reason is because we have those, uh, I don't know, 8 million uh, users going through the first phase of the funnel, then only uh, uh, about 3K of them uh, went through the homepage, and less than that arrived to the product page. So those users actually went through the funnel in the predefined order of the funnel. However, some users were able to reach the product page without going through the, I don't know, online advertisement or the homepage. Uh, they uh, could have used, for example, a Google search, right? Now, the reason that uh, uh, we sometimes care is in uh, in few use cases, we actually want to measure only the users that went through the funnel in the way that we describe it, and not if they reached it through other means, okay? So, now it becomes not a simple uh, use case, but a complex use case. And the question is how many unique users viewed the online ad versus how many unique users viewed the online ad first and then viewed the product X page. So uh, our term for that is a sequential funnel. And that happens where the chronological order of events is important, as I mentioned. Now, our data pipeline, sorry, our data pipeline is similar, however, in these use cases of sequential funnel, we only take into account the events that happened in the predefined order of the funnel. That way we actually represent better the efficiency of the specific tactic or the specific advertisement, right? Because we know for, for sure that only the users that went through the funnel, uh, through all the stages as we predefined them, uh, were actually uh, exposed to that uh, uh, advertisement first, and that's why they acted upon it and not uh, uh, reach the uh, product page via other means. So just as a reminder, this is the pipeline. Uh, the, um, the data lake, the, the events in the data lake are the same. Uh, however, now you can see that uh, I added the actual time for each event. So you can see that uh, for user ID one, he visited product page X at uh, 9.15. And only about an hour later, he saw the online ad and after that visited the homepage. This part is, uh, uh, is behaving the same. The mild generator where we, where we partition events by campaign still stays the same. We have the event time, the user ID. We still have the product page as a stage. And now you think, okay, at this point where we uh, enrich the data and build the funnel, we should or shouldn't have the event where for this date, we have the online ad first and then product X page. And you'll probably be correct because we ignore, as I mentioned, those events that didn't happen uh, according to the predefined order. So after ignoring those events, we only keep those events that actually happened by the order we defined the panel, the funnel, sorry. Again, not going to go over how to query it, and even the SQL is a bit uh, complicated. And thank you very much, Ben, for, uh, <laughs> for building this SQL query. Uh, so this is quite a complicated query because it's a quite a complicated use case to achieve. But Druid and Spark allows us to do it. And after we ingest the data in, into Druid, we can do uh, a data sketch not between the intersection of uh, uh, the tactic and the homepage. And what uh, uh, happened after that. 
So basically, this query should return, and I'm saying should because it's not tested in production. Uh, as I mentioned, we use the JSON uh, query language, but uh, it should return the estimated number of unique users for the drop-off between the home page and the product page. So a bit complicated, but Druid allows us to do that. So uh, looking at the results of the complex use case and zooming in, now you can see that after ignoring those uh, uh, out-of-order events, we were able to achieve the right, sorry, the right numbers, right? We ignored the, uh, the out-of-order events. Now we have the correct numbers. And going back to uh, the same funnel, so we have the users going through the funnel as ordered. We have users coming out from uh, the outside of the funnel, and we ignore those events. OK, so a few concrete tips uh, which we think will uh, really uh, help you using Druid. So do use uh, uh, Druid with Theta Sketch to get fast approximate count distinct. And this will allow you to do set operations, as I mentioned, your section unions, et cetera. Uh, you really should use Spark to pre-process incoming events. Uh, first of all, because that allows you to decide how you handle those out-of-order events. Uh, second of all, uh, we encourage you to check out our optimizing Spark-based data pipelines, which is uh, related to this talk. And we have the videos and the slides up there as well. And lastly, you can, in op you can significantly optimize your ingestion process. And the way you do it, since you pre-process the data with Spark, other, uh, instead of writing uh, the, the process data into S3 and then load it into uh, Druid, you actually write data sketch objects directly from Spark. You can do it uh, using the uh, data sketches library. And then you can use this flag, which is a really cool flag. It saved us a lot, a lot of money uh, for uh, uh, AWS build. And you can use this uh, is input data sketch flag, set it to true in order to load those objects into Druid. OK, so uh, what have we learned? We learned that Druid is a very powerful tool for real-time analytics, highly scalable, in just, can you just uh, install trillions of events, and serve analytic queries really fast. And it's used for many different use cases. We've uh, understood what is funnel analysis, why it's important for our advertisers, and why it's not easy to solve it technically, especially if we care about the order of events. Luckily for us, combining Spark, Druid, and Theta Sketch is for the win here. Uh, we pre-process the events before ingesting into Druid, and we can also decide how to lay how to handle out of order events. Yes, yes, yes. You you re you say, for example, you run your Spark application every few hours. Okay, then you write the data into uh, S3 or whatever storage you're using. The inter like the interim batch data, okay, in Theta Sketch. Then uh, in Druid, in our example, uh, we want to uh, uh, have the one day granularity, not few hours. So you need Druid in order to combine all those uh, sketches into the granularity you chose. Okay, so just before I wrap things up, a few things we care about. Uh, women Big Data is a worldwide program that aims to inspire, uh, connect, grow, and champion success of women in the big data and analytics field. Um, and there are over 20 chapters worldwide, including the Israeli chapter, and everyone can join, uh, regardless of gender. Uh, in April, uh, we're going to talk about casting the spell Druid in practice, which is an advanced Druid talk, uh, both in Druid Summit uh, San Francisco. Yeah! Uh, and thank you, uh, uh, my friends from Implant for that. And also in uh, Strata, just a few days later uh, in London. And lastly, we have our uh, tech blog where we uh, write about the interesting things we do here at uh, Nielsen. And I think this specific blog about data retention and deletion in a Druid will probably interest you. That's it for me. And I'll be taking questions now. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the question was, I'll repeat it so uh, it will be recorded. So the question was about updating data. It's a bit complex. Uh, well, in the new native batch ingestion, there is a way to do actual updates. And I'm looking at you to confirm. <laughs> um, there is a way to do it. Uh, if you use the Hadoop ingestion, 
it's not really updating, it's rather uh, uh, overwriting and create new version of the segments, but it essentially can uh, gain the same effect depending how you, you know, do the ingestion, but you can do it, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, great question. Uh, the question was about using Spark Batch or uh, uh, Spark Streaming, uh, aka micro batches. So uh, I think we described some of this in uh, in our previous talks, and I will I will share the. Um, Things later, but for us, we were able to uh, um, gain both performance uh, um, gains and cost gains by using Spark Batch a few times a day rather than using Spark Streaming. You are you you are able to aggregate into a better ratio, right? So uh, I know five minutes or, or thirty minutes micro batch will be it will get you only to some point of aggregation. Yeah, for us, uh, uh, doing a few hours of batches is, is fine. Yeah. Yes, any other questions? Okay, cool. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. And we'll take a few minutes uh, break. And in five, we'll be back to Eddie's talk. Thank you.